Let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It's so nice to be with you. I am uh, excited for this episode because I don't know what the hell's going on. So I'm going to have Ryan Holt explain it to you. Harry, mysteriously missing again. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, as the man says. Harry is off this week. We're recording on Wednesday instead of Tuesday, and he just had a conflict. So he was gracious enough to give us permission just to do this without him. Uh, and it may be better because we've got a lot to cover tonight, and it probably is better if it's just two people. Um, so I'm saying the show's better without Harry. You can go in the Discord and tell him I said that. Uh, I'm just kidding. Love Harry. And if you want to join the Discord and ask him, is everything okay with you and dear leader? I didn't hear you on the show. I just wanted to make sure you're okay. Maybe you got that cornucopia flu or whatever is going on in China. That's that's what the rumor that will spread, Reinhold. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, Reinhold, oh, yeah. me. thank you so much for being here, Reinhold. I'm glad to be here. And um, I do miss Harry. I want him back soon. So I hope he feels better. Sure I'm going yeah. to ask everyone to go into the Discord. Let's troll Harry together because this really worked the last time we did it, so we'll just keep doing it if it works. And you go to our, our website, wearelibertarians.com, and you can join the Discord server there. And just ask, Harry, how are you recovering from that Chinese flu? Because he caught it. He uh, you know, he has an international job, and uh, he was hanging out with uh, Chinese people, and he caught the cornucopia flu. What is it called? Uh Cornucopia, or I, I actually don't even know uh, how to ask, say it. I haven't, I've looked at pronounce- it and saw it once. Yeah, ask Gary how to pronounce the disease that will kill him. Well, I mean, he, he goes to San Francisco and hangs out that's with the, uh, the poop on the street. <laughs> and that's where he's side got. of town, apparently. <laughs> this is great. I love trolling Harry. It's so much fun. Um, we are going to talk to uh, – talk to. I'm sorry. I am discombobulated today. I'm out of sorts. I'm – you know, I've, it t- took me 45 minutes to get here and get set up, and I appreciate Reinhold's patience because he's he and Harry are very patient with me uh, because I'm always scrambling to r- run home, get home. I got to eat. I got to get my Chick-fil-A in, which is my pre-show meal. And uh, so I appreciate your patience, Reinhold. Uh, no problem at all. I was just uh, spending some time here after work, relaxing, having a little bit of uh, a little drink, the Serena. Oh, look at you. You're actually relaxing for the evening. There hasn't been drinking on the show since, well, 2017. Let's put it that way. Very... <laughs> By court order? Is that what it was? Uh, well, no. <laughs> very dry show since then, that's for sure. Um, we're going to talk about the AUMF and the war power resolutions and, and the Kane bill that's moving through. We're going to talk basically about the legal... Um, the legal aspects of declaring on war in the third installment of our little mini series here on Iran. And and it's funny with these stories, how the news cycle moves on so quickly. You want to do a deep dive, but if you do one show a week, you know, it's, it's week three now. And frankly, nobody cares about the cane bill and military authorization in Iran because "Ah, that's not going to happen. We've moved on. We're on to impeachment now. You know, plus they can't do anything about it now because the impeachment trial is taking up. They, they have to stop all business while the impeachment trial is going on in the Senate. So, but I feel that it's important for people to understand where the government gets the authority to start these uh, wars, and so we're going to cover that tonight. But I do want to talk about impeachment and uh, get an update from Reinhold in just a moment. But uh, first, I want to say thank you to all of our listeners. You all are very sweet. I said, hey, I'd love to hear from you guys. If you were 
uh, a listener and the show has affected you in some way or you uh, just want to share with the listeners uh, your appreciation of the show or if you're a patron and you want to explain why you donate, I got a lot of great emails. We'll read those to you. You can certainly send us an email at editor at wearelibertarians.com or spangle at wearelibertarians.com. goes with the same email box. Got a lot of great letters. And one of those is Joshua Laughlin. And he sent this beautiful note. I, <laughs> this is so funny to me. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast since 2014 when I found you on Twitter during the controversy around the police shooting in St. Louis. I didn't really listen to podcasts much before that, but going through all your older shows really got me into podcasts. It's been years, and I've tried a bunch of other podcasts, but this is the only one that I download every episode of. I look forward to listening to these podcasts and have enjoyed listening to Chris's growth over the years. My son is just starting to babble in the back seat these days, and he talks back to Chris more than any other podcaster I listen to. Chris's voice in my car is really a part of our family now, and I hope he keeps doing We Are Libertarians for years to come so that doesn't have to change. That is very sweet, and I want to thank Joshua for sending that note in. And, uh, uh, you know, it's an honor for me, Reinhold, to be influencing the youth of America. Well, they need some guidance. That's right? true. So and hopefully you, we can help. Yes. When you think of parental guidance, you think Reinhold and Spangle. Yeah. We got you covered. Yes. We'll take care of you. We are here we're we're the mentors of the, of the uh, libertarian movement, <laughs> despite what other people might say. That's right. That's, that's what we do. Them. Don't listen to them at all. So thank you so much for the nice note. And that's just one of the, the impacts. That's in, when you're a patron of this show, you were supporting helping Reinhold and I raise the children of other people. And isn't that the best gift you can give is a free future? So join Patreon today. Uh, so thank you so much, Joshua. And like I said, that, that kind of impact, that is a five-year relationship that we have with this listener where we're in their car every single week talking to Joshua, informing him about what's going on. And that's only possible because our patrons pay the bills. So please join our Patreon at wearelibertarians.com or Patreon slash we are libertarians. And uh, you join up, you get some bonus material. We're going to do a little, do some extras. We're working on extras as we speak to try and make this a little more attractive to you. But I want to give a special thank you to our $100 a month uh, subscribers. That is Ed Brehob, Matthew Durbin, Jeff Bennett, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, and Craig DaCosta. You guys are all stars. And I want to thank all the patrons. I sent out a little note and a magnet to all the lapsed patrons, the people who hadn't updated their card, and, and many of you have updated your card, and I thank you guys for coming back. Um, that is so appreciated, and we thank you so much for helping us reach people like Joshua. Uh, you're really making a difference, and when you, uh, when, not, not just when you become a patron, but also when you just share the show. You know, that person was on Twitter and saw a post of ours and saw that we had an episode out there, and that may have come from me or the wall Twitter or... Uh, a friend or a listener or whatever, but you know, by putting the the podcast out onto Twitter, w Joshua has grown and grown and grown into a better libertarian. And Reinhold, I might say a real libertarian. Yeah, it depends on how you define real libertarian. But if, I think if they're fans of this show, then they are real libertarians. I mean, that's I, one of the defining moments, I think. In the I agree. Internet. I think if you listen to this show, you're a real libertarian. And if you listen to any other libertarian podcast, but not ours, you're not a real libertarian. And that, that seems to be the going, that seems to be the prevailing wisdom in the libertarian movement. So let's just go with it. Right. Everybody is wrong except for us. That's right. That's that's how it works. Um, and if you say bad things about us, then you're not a real libertarian. But if you say nice things about us, then you're in the club. Right. Well, we just want to monetize against those people. That's too, so. <laughs> all right. Now you're showing your bias. Um, let. All right. So here's the thing, Reinhold. I have been very busy this week. I've had very long days. Uh, I I'm very tired. I've not had a chance to read the news, and. What a, what a mistake that is for somebody who runs a news podcast, but I've just been too busy to keep up. And so I really want to talk about the AUMF tonight, and we're going to, 
but if we don't at least give people a little bit of an impeachment update, then it may be over by the time we get to next Tuesday evening. So if you would, um, you know, I don't know where we stopped in. We've covered impeachment kind of up to this point. I know there was some stuff with Nancy Pelosi not giving the stuff over to the Senate. And then there was some stuff where Mitch McConnell in the Senate set some rules that nobody liked and won't call some witnesses. And then there's some Parnell guy that I don't know what's going on. And then now they're like giving speeches in the Senate. And so I barely have paid attention. I need you to explain to me what the hell is going on. So let's start with like, what was the whole Nancy Pelosi thing holding stuff up? What was that about? Okay. So Nancy Pelosi, when they got the, uh, the impeachment, um, you know, passed, right. they were supposed to, uh, put together a list of who's going to be the house managers. And then those house managers walk in a ceremony, walk the uh, impeachment over to the Senate. Now this happened. Are like the, they're, they're like the prosecutors, right? Right. They're the ones who are going to present the case. And then the Senate picks their own or the de- defense of the president. They pick their own uh, managers of the, of the defense. And then that's how they kind of are, uh, debate this. No one else can really talk or anything during this whole thing. So they were supposed to march them over. Now, this was like a week before Christmas. Senate's going on Christmas break. She wanted to know what kind of trial they were going to, to have because she wouldn't know which people to put on as the managers based off how they were going to run the trial. McConnell didn't want to talk about it. Um, so that created a standoff where she said, I want to make sure that you're going to take this seriously and call witnesses uh, that need to be called in order to get this information out because we've got information that's just coming out since we've done this impeachment too. We didn't get any of the information from the, the president that we asked for. Uh, so she was trying to hold uh, McConnell's feet to the fire as it were, but, Okay, but which didn't make any sense because he didn't want to do it anyway. Yeah, but couldn't ha- they have called the witnesses themselves? Like they were in charge of the impeachment in the House. Why didn't they call the witnesses, meaning – you know, mm-hmm. Sondlin and uh, Giuliani and, and John Bolton and some of these people we've talked about. Why didn't they do it? Well, they did request those people to um, come talk during the impeachment and be deposed, and they declined. So the subpoenas were issued, and then the uh, president basically said no, one's going, no one should talk to the, the House for any reason. No documents can go over there, all this stuff. So he was claiming – that he had the right to, to deny the, the subpoenas for a couple of different reasons, all which are bogus, and I can go into more detail next week on why they are. Um, but that was, that was the kind of the argument that they were making, that we're just going to pretend like this isn't going on. So the, the House, instead of going into a protracted, multi-year fight for subpoenas, because remember, we've got Don McCann, who was subpoenaed over a year ago, um, after the Mueller investigation and, and trying to find out if he obstructed justice in that, um, they subpoenaed McGann and it's still in the courts. And it's still in the lower courts. It's not going to get to a Supreme Court decision probably until well after the election. Right? Right. So they decided that they had, they had enough information to prove their case. There was no other information they were getting from the president that was uh, making it, you know, exonerating him in any way. Uh, they would like to have got more information, obviously. They would like to get uh, even more evidence just to kind of say, look. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't but, it fair to say, though, they didn't want to actually go through the hassle of suing? It would have taken forever in court to get courts to force <laughs> him to have these people well, testify. And it probably would have gone past the election. Isn't it very much so. be, at the end of the day, political that they didn't call it, these? Well, it's, it's that, too. But you also remember they were asking for – certain things and and Trump's team was filing uh, their position on whether or not this should happen or not. And their argument was that the courts have no say in this since it's a political uh, impeachment process that the courts should not be weighing in in any way on it. So they wanted, they wanted the, the, the Democrats to go and fight for the subpoenas, but then they were also arguing that they had no right to do that. They had no standing. Okay, so isn't it kind of stupid then to say to the Republican-controlled Senate, uh, well, you should call witnesses, otherwise we're not going to hand over. We're in a rush to get him impeached. Mm -hmm. 
but we're going to withhold the articles to the Senate until you do the thing that we ourselves didn't really fight for. Isn't so there, that just kind of stupid and nakedly political once you really look at it? Well, there's two ways to see, to see it. Okay, the first one is that – I mean, this this took place while the Senate was out of – um you know, they, they were out for Christmas break. So there were weeks going by that there was nothing going to happen anyway. So that doesn't really impact anything. It probably delayed the trial by about a week and a half right. with what they did. It's not like they, you know, they're saying, well, it's been 33 days. I said, yeah, but you guys were out for a long time. And that's not how it's going to work. But um, it was a calculation on her part, whether it was good or bad. There's a lot of discussion back and forth on that. Uh, it did get kind of, see, the problem is, is that we have, polling going on now that shows that 69% of the people want there to be, you know, believe that this happened. A vast majority want there to be witnesses called. And I think part of that number is because she did what she did and, and highlighted that the, the Senate was going to do this. So that was the political calculation that she made there. Right. But like, why withhold them if they're not, you know, they're not going to call the witnesses. Like, well, they're not going to find him guilty either, so I have the trial. <laughs> I, that's, I've been – I mean, listen, what he did was was impeachable. I've thought that from the beginning, but it's kind of like a <laughs> foregone conclusion. Like, why waste your, why waste our time and money and effort? Like, it just the is reason, stupid to Well, me. there's two reasons why. One, you have to at some point exert your – like, if you have a copyright, if you don't right. exert your copyright to lame, then, you know, you lose it. Okay. Because you're not fighting it. So I, I think what they're trying to say is we do not find this acceptable. We believe that this is wrong and we want to make our case. And that's the other part. Make our case to the people so the people can hear the, the information. They can make their decisions and determine whether or not they want to either call their senators and pressure them into actually changing their vote and maybe voting against them. Because the majority of people do want him, like 51 percent of the people want him removed over this so if it's inherently a pr battle mm -hmm. is trump not smart to hire people like uh ken Starr and alan dershowitz and jay seculo people who are media creatures at this point mm -hmm. not necessarily legal creatures but isn't it smart of trump to not participate in any of this at all and just say, I deny that, th that I did anything wrong. I'm going to pretend that this isn't happening. I'm going to hire people to make the PR case as opposed to the legal case. That's definitely the decision he's made to try to take. Uh, whether it's good or not is dependent upon, I think, partially on who you get. Right. I think the problem with Starr and Dershowitz is that they both argued against the exact thing that they're saying as a defense right now when Clinton mm -hmm. was around. So it's kind of – they're just kind of looking yeah, very bad nobody, to do that. Nobody cares about consistency anymore. <laughs> People only care about are yeah, you making the best it, case for the bias I care about. It, it depends on whether you can get that viralized, right? If you can make that a viral thing, the people will hear it, and then, then it becomes a, a matter. So, so are you saying we're governing by memes now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, and then the president, though, isn't doing himself any favors after what he did uh, this morning. What did he do this morning? Uh, so they, the House spent all day. So the, the first day of the impeachment, the House spent the day trying to get them to um, decide to take uh, witnesses and documentation. They want the documentation, right? So they want all these documents from the, the, that they've asked for from the president but haven't gotten yet. So they would put in a motion to try and get that, and then it was – voted down because the, the decision is now we're going to do the opening arguments and then we're going to decide if we need witnesses or not. And a lot of people know that that's probably not going to happen. Right. So they're trying to get the witnesses and, and the documentation up ahead of time. So they put in motion after motion, uh, different tweaking it and trying to get different points across and, and all of them were, were shot down. So the president came on afterwards because he's in, uh, he's out of the country and he's in a place that's, different times so he was speaking to him this evening which was this morning for us after right. what happened and he starts in with well if they saw the documents they'd know that i was that there was nothing wrong it was a perfect call we have the documents and they don't and i'm like <laughs> that's their point <laughs> why don't you show them the documents if they're supposed to exonerate you 
So I don't know what he was thinking when he said that. That's it just played right into the, the Democrats' hands. It's almost like he's wanting them to impeach him and get him out of and remove him from office. It, it almost feels that way. I know it's not true, but it feels that way sometimes. I, I, sometimes it really does feel like he's subconsciously trying to get himself kicked out so he doesn't have to yeah. do this anymore. Yeah, I think uh, I think he's, he's losing money. He's just tired of it. He doesn't like being treated like this. He just wants to go out with uh, everybody loving him. And he's not, upset that that's not happening. Yes, but is it not hilarious when he tweets in all caps, I have been impeached for a perfect phone call? Because yeah. I laughed hysterically when I saw it. It's it's insane that he thinks that – and he said that today in his uh, little speech when he was talking about the documents. He also said, I released a phone call. once the, well, They didn't think I was going to do it. Once I released it, they knew they had no case because it was perfect. And I'm like, dude, the <laughs> phone call is pretty obvious what you were doing there. I mean, I don't understand why you think that exonerates you. Uh, I haven't heard anybody actually explain it. They just say – Go read the transcript and you'll figure it out. I'm like, no, I read the transcript. It's pretty clear what he was doing and what he was asking for. I've seen enough mob movies. I know how they talk. But, um, you need to do something better than that. That doesn't exonerate anybody. Okay. So what is happening yesterday, today, presumably tomorrow? Like what's going on in the process? So yesterday was the um, kind of debate on what they were going to do for uh, deciding the trial rules right so mitch mcconnell mitch mcconnell came up with the uh rules that he wanted to enforce as as for the senate rules he made some last minute changes because some of the republicans kind of raised some objections to doing this over two days they decided it, it would be better to do it over three because he's trying to push to get it done so he hastily hand wrote some changes onto the um the bill and they started debating the bill yesterday. And, the, and then they were free to, both sides were free to put in motions uh, before they voted on accepting the rules. And that's when the motions came in, hey, we need, we need uh, um, witnesses, which they knew they were going to get them. I think they were hoping that, you know, they would, they would be able to. But uh, I think part of the reason was is that they had two hours for every motion to present their case and why they should get witnesses. And the, all during that time, they're showing evidence and evidence, you know, here's this clip of this person saying this, and here's a, uh, the text message from this person. Here's the email from this person. So they were showing all this evidence during the, the process. So they were kind of getting some stuff in early, right? So at the end of the day, they ended up not getting anything they wanted. The, the, um, the day ended around 2 a.m. So let me ask, we'll stop at 2 a.m. But so like, <laughs> let me ask if they're, articulating what these people have said already mm -hmm. then why does it matter if they actually physically come and testify isn't it just because they want the the publicity they want really something to be mad about to make the other side look bad about which is this witnesses thing but is there any well, like it's technical, not, it's legal, not... technical legal reason that these people need to come and testify or is it just they want the dog and pony show well it's, there's there's technical legal reasons why the and it's not just the, the witnesses that say oh, they want the documentation that Trump says he has sitting right there mm -hmm. proving his innocence, right? Because um, that information, I mean, they want like the discussions between Mulvaney and uh, OMB, you know, what, what went on there? You know, what was the discussion going back and forth to prove that he was doing it without the proper information? And we had the, um, the, the OMB watchdog group come out, the GOA, and, and found that what Trump had done was against the uh, Impoundment Act. So that was a, a violation of the law that he committed there. Um, An so, Impoundment Act is where, what, he puts dogs? In? No, so basically it says that when the um, when Congress votes to, to spend money to authorize funding for something and then uh, everybody signs it, it, vote, it gets voted through, the president signs it, it's now law. The um, the executive has to faithfully do what it says it has to do. Now there are some reasons why they can say that they can't do it. Like if the the money was supposed to go to something that uh, can't be done, like they they had voted money to invent something that they can't make that invention happen or something like that. He can he can go back and notify Congress and say I'm not going to spend the money because of this reason. 
but he didn't do any of that. He was supposed to notify Congress. He didn't. He was supposed to have a reason, a valid reason why he could not faithfully um, do it. And he was doing it for political reasons. And even, even if his stated goal that he was trying to get Ukraine to um, not be corrupt anymore, which mm-hmm. is bonkers um, to begin with. The, you mean the most corrupt president thus far yeah. doesn't yeah. clean up other countries, but not ours. Okay. Um, but even if that was true, it would still violate the law. He had no, he had no valid reason why to do this. So they, they wanted that documentation uh, and emails going back forth on that. They wanted the, uh, they want John Bolton, the people who refused to show up during the House trial, the, the House impeachment, but have said publicly that if called on in the Senate, they would come in, mm-hmm. right? John Bolton being one of them. So they want to bring some of these people in so they can get more information about what happened. And if it proves, in their cases, if it proves that the, the president's innocent, great, then we have the answer. We have the truth. Right. But they they're pretty confident that it's not going to be the case that none of this stuff is going to exonerate anybody. So I think if he had evidence or it was going to work out in his favor, he'd let these people testify. He'd blast oh, yeah. from the rooftops. He'd be on Fox and Friends touting the information that he's not. I mean, he is a PR master and, you know, everybody's a genius at something. For some people, it's, you know, marketing. Some people it's it's politics. Some people it's genius genius like you know with math for him it's getting attention for himself it's pr and they're good about finding ways to get their side of the story out and having it penetrate through in a way that most republicans just can't do in in a media environment that is heavily democrat biased and so if they have the information i don't think there's any doubt in my mind that they would use documents or witnesses or whatever. They'd, they'd turn it into their own dog and pony show. Of, See, there's nothing here. Right. And part of the issue too, is that some of that documentation that they were asking for has been released, but not by the president. It was, they were released by uh, freedom of information act lawsuits. Um, now the, there was another release of those documents last night at midnight uh, from because the, the the deadline was by midnight that night that they had to be uh, released, so they released them like two minutes before midnight, and right. they're heavily, heavily, heavily redacted. Hmm. Right, so that's always the problem too is that they want the unredacted information, and they're just getting blanks. They're getting, they're getting paper uh, where somebody's gone out of business trying to use black sharpie to cover everything up. So it ended at two a.m. last night. What are they doing today and tomorrow? Uh, well, it, by the way, it ended last night with uh, Justice Roberts admonishing the House, uh, the the managers and the defense for their behavior that they were portraying. They were getting unsnarky with each other and calling uh, someone called Nadler a liar or a shuffle liar. I don't remember which one. And then Nadler said something about the the uh, senators. Um, and, and it just it started getting a little bit heated, so he had to come down and put the gavel down on him and tell him that they needed to uh, shape up. So today, because there were no more um, um, there were no more things going in to say, hey, we need to uh, make changes, right? So everybody was good with what was going on. They voted the rules in, and then they started the trial, uh, which starts off with. Uh, 12 hours of the house giving presenting their information. So shift talked for three, almost two and a half to three hours. Can you imagine today. anything worse? Yeah. The, he, he talked for like, and it was funny cause he, people were, I was listening to somebody commenting on this and we were at two hours and they were like, he's still on the first article. Uh. And so he must be just doing the first article and the guy have somebody else do the second article. And then everybody's kind of getting up and getting ready to kind of go out after two hours. And then he goes, and the second article, blah, blah, blah. It starts <laughs> into that for another 20 minutes. <laughs> so everybody was just like standing up and wanting to go because they can't leave. They can't go to the bathroom. They can actually be put in jail if they leave to go to the bathroom oh, unless they're kidding. dismissed to do. Oh, it's, it's, it's like being in detention for these people. It's, <laughs> they can't have their phone. They can't talk to their neighbor. Uh, they can't go to the bathroom without permission. I mean, it's, it's, 
amazing the rules that they have for for the this this Horrible. process so that's what kind of where and and it's still going on right now so I, I don't know exactly what's happening this moment but i know uh shift spoke for about two and a half hours they went on break they came back uh nadler spoke for 20 minutes i think and then that's when i had to kind of walk away and start doing some things and getting ready for this Just living your life in reality yeah i had to kind of pull back from the show you know as it were and uh, it's it's you hard because he, you have to understand <laughs> audience he loves this he's so into i do it. it's and well it's history it. it's it's to me it's history that you're not going to experience probably again right so i was around a little bit for the for the clinton trial stuff and but i was working two jobs so i didn't get a chance to just sit and watch it and it wasn't like there was a lot of real ability there was no internet like this then i mean it was just kind right. of getting started to, to talk the dot net boom and all that so it was a little iffy google wasn't really that big of a thing so it, it's interesting to see all of this information and be able to interact with it real time and and not have to go read it like a history book i right. want to live it and experience it. right um okay so my uh, my second to last question is who is this lynn parnev person oh it's lev parnas okay. now we found out here's the fun part we found out that Lev Parnas's name is pronounced that way. Okay. Everybody had been calling him Lev Parnes because okay. that's the way you kind of you would think it was, except for one person. One person called him Lev Parnas from day one, and that was Devin Nunes, who was accused of having a relationship with him, and he filed lawsuits saying that he didn't. And then we found out after uh, the Justice Department tried but failed to keep his information secret, Mm -hmm. from his phone uh phone records and and personal effects they got released and lo and behold he had been working with De with devin nunes okay. and he was working with ukrainians and and working he was sending what? text messages huh working on what though uh he was working for giuliani and setting up the um doing kind of the back channel stuff with uh, the former prosecutor, the the prosecutor at the time, some of the Ukrainian uh, oligarchs who are out of favor right now, who are kind of making this push to, they were trying to make the push to get rid of um, Ivanovich because she was pushing for, you know, anti-corruption um, laws and, and all that in effect. So, they wanted her out. They had Parnez and Giuliani making deals to say, get her out and we'll give you this information that'll exonerate Trump and prove that Biden was guilty and all this stuff. They're making all this up for them. And they're working with uh, John Solomon, who most of all of this information on Biden that's wrong came from uh, his writing in the Hill uh, he was actually sending his articles through Parnes to the Ukrainians and getting their okay on it and having them make changes to it days before he published it. Yeah, and the Solomon affair, basically the Hill, which is a venerated publication. Like if you're gonna, if you want to know what's going on in D.C. in kind of a non non biased way, Politico, the Hill, Roll Call, the National Journal, um, the Hill, and the Hill is kind of on the fence financially. Mm -hmm. And the Solomon thing is really putting them, they're looking for a buyer now. It's, a crunch, um, yeah. it's pretty much, okay, I'm sorry, that well, was Mitten who decided. Well, they're to looking to pull all of his articles. They're reexamining all of his articles and they may yeah. pull them all. Um, there was a famous. You no, know, the media is that tense, one bad scandal, and now you're mm -hmm. venerated longtime publications out. Okay, so so does this guy have the the goods on Trump? Is he like the key? Is he the smoking gun in terms of witnesses? He's got a lot of stuff. The problem is is that he is also a uh, being charged with a felony. There's good indication that he and um, his fellow compatriot were being set up to be the fall guys, and he doesn't trust Barr because Barr was involved in all of this stuff, even though Barr says he wasn't. Lev says he was, and he doesn't trust Barr, so he can't go through the Justice Department, so he had to make a deal with, he's trying to make a deal with Congress in order to get his voice heard. Now, some people say that he's probably making a lot of this stuff up, and his point, his his actual testimony, you know, we can take 
one way or the other, but the fact that he has documentation, text messages, phone call records, that sort of thing. In those, we found out that there was a uh, gentleman that was is now running for Congress who was communicating with Parnes, and he was hiring security teams to follow the ambassador around and even offered to have her killed. Mm. Wow. Now, he says he was heavily drinking that t- during that time, that time being less than a year ago, by the way, um, wow. and he's running for office, and that he was just joking around. And Parnes says he, you know, he assumed that the guy was joking. He didn't take it seriously. But still, the fact that he was, you know, putting those in tweets and saying that stuff, and the Ukrainians are now investigating whether or not this actually happened with the uh, the ambassador being followed because they're very upset about that i'm sure it's the first time this first time the ukraine got involved in any of this stuff when they heard this you know they're the most they're trying to stay out of it right they're doing their best just to not piss anybody off because they know that you know right now trump's in office but it could be a democrat it could be trump again you can't go one way or the other you got to be you know they're trying to hedge their bets on both sides they're just trying to keep quiet and not make any ways right so for them to come out and do that i think was pretty it shows how they were, how much concern they had for it. So but there's one final question, mm-hmm. and then we'll move on to with the war powers. Sure. What is about what happens next? Like what will happen between right. now and presumably our next episode? So the the house managers are going to present their case, finish presenting their case, which they're doing right now. The defense will present their case, and then they're going to have a discussion on whether or not they should go ahead and do a finding of uh, innocent or guilty, or if they should have more witnesses to look into more information, that sort of thing. Now, one thing that was brought up and is very important to understand is that in every impeachment trial that the Senate has done, and there's been 20 now, in every case, there were always new witnesses called that weren't called in the original House impeachment inquiry. Mm -hmm. so this would be the first time they didn't have any witnesses at all right for anything so there's a lot of people kind of worried about how that's going to look on the uh on the republican side uh susan collins and a couple others who are kind of in purple states and they could go either way on their support and if their polling numbers is showing that people want witnesses they may vote for witnesses so it could end up being that they can get they've got three people right now to say they want more witnesses. If they can get a fourth person to buck the trend, then that will happen and it will extend out the process. If Rand Paul gets his way, he believes that the trial should be over already before anybody even spoke. And he's trying to get it shut. He was trying to get it shut down before they even presented arguments today. Right. He says he's got 43 people on his side. He just needs another seven. Uh, and then he can get this thing stopped and, and, because a senator, a senator can file like a motion and then that just ends it, right? Right. I mean, they, they can always file a motion, but they also, they were trying before the rules uh, were voted on this morning after discussion last night, deliberation last night. Um, there was still a chance that they could have put some more motions in. And one of those motions could have been uh, the summer early dismissed. So that didn't happen because he didn't have the votes. I think enough, there's enough senators who are like, that would look a little too bad. We're going to hold off on that. But the fact that 43 people are willing to do that is kind of concerning too. And I think that right. we're going to see some after effects. See, a lot of people think that we're going to have the same result that happened with Clinton, uh, that the, the Republicans took a beating because of it. But the problem there is that the support for impeachment of Clinton never rose above 30%. Uh, it was always in the low in the twenties or, or even less than that for the most of the time. It never rose above thirty. We've got fifty one percent of the people saying he should be removed. We got sixty eight, sixty nine percent of the people think he's guilty of what there is, is accused of. So I don't think there's going to be the negative backlash to the Democrats that happened to the Republicans. The question is is how are the Republicans going to get viewed, and are they going to take any backlash from their basically just saying this all doesn't matter. We just ignore it, put it under the rug. Yeah. So um, their, their argument is flimsy at best. So this just, I just saw this in the group. Um, 
Schiff said at one point, the president's misconduct cannot be decided at the ballot box, for we cannot be assured that the vote will be fairly won. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that's drama, first of all. Well, it's and not drama, but all, it is also, who, it's who also true. Think, it, it's not true. Please. Sure the, it is. Idea, the idea, no, pl uh, no, please you. That's what I say. Okay. The reality right, is that th using the impeachment process as they have, knowing that they were never going to get a conviction, is just is it's using PR and propaganda to get Trump out of office as much as Trump tried to do the same to Biden. Like this is well, I don't this think is how Paul, this is how elections and free societies work. Right. Like I don't the think they go down this process if they don't hope that they can get him removed from the Senate trial. I don't. I don't agree. I think they. I think Nancy Pelosi was boxed in and had to do impeachment. She had. She. He, he forced her hand with this phone call, but the reality is none of them wanted to do it because they know the reality is that it, 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 would, it would take p independent minded people like me and go, you're just as partisan and hacky as he is. So why should we look at you as some sort of moral bastion? And now you're it's telling posted. me that because you're not, you're already saying I might not like the next vote. So therefore I'm going to throw a fit like I did over 2016. He won 2016 square and fair. But they've never acted that way. They've never pretended that he did. They've they've pulled the Stacey Abrams in Georgia who walks around and acts like she's somehow governor, even though she didn't win 50,000 votes. This is the new Democratic playbook where they just decry the, the most chilling thing that Donald Trump said. And I said it here on the show in 2016 was when he said, I might not uh, I might not accept the, the election results. And I just was horrified by that because that is banana republic stuff. And the Democrats wailed and moaned and Hillary Clinton did too. And they've done the exact same thing. That's really what it comes down to. Like the idea that Donald Trump trying to dig up dirt uh, with uh, on Joe Biden is somehow like it's egregious, yes. But it, at the same time, isn't it like – <sighs> You're going to tell me that you, 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 Adam Schiff, should be the one to remove Donald Trump instead of the voters in 2020. That's a bold strategy. That's a pretty condescending strategy that didn't work for them in 2016. None of this really makes sense from a PR politics standpoint. It's just more of the same. I think people just start to tune all this stuff out and just go, I don't really understand it. I don't really care. It's all a lot of noise. I'm going to show up and I'm going to vote for Trump or I'm going to show up and vote against Trump. In some ways, I think a lot of the 2020 election has already been decided because everybody knows whether or not they want to vote for Trump. The, they're just waiting to see, is it Bernie? Is it Biden? Is it Buttigieg? Is it you know, Bloomberg or any of the other Bs that might win the nomination? And really, this is going to come down to the very slim amount of independence in this country. I mean, I just I look at it and go, if Adam Schiff is trying to tell me that I can't trust the results of the next election because Donald Trump might cheat, I don't believe the messenger. I, I'm, I'm not, it's not that I doubt that he would. I'm sure he would. It's just that I think they would, too. So why do I feel that he should be the one to decide whether or not I can't choose Donald Trump as president or not? I just don't think that that's a winning strategy. I think all of this doesn't do for them what they think it's going to do. So there should be no impeachment ever. We should get rid of it out of the Constitution. I have because it's overriding the will of the people. I, and that has been our argument from the very beginning, which is I have a much higher bar for what I think uh, an impeachment is a much it, it's far more traumatic for the country, although this has not been traumatic at all because people have clearly stopped paying attention to anything in Washington, D.C., it, it, this is nothing like the Clinton impeachment. I mean, you, you and I were both alive, and the Clinton impeachment was like the first thing that I really watched in, in terms of politics, and it was just constant. It was all over the place all the time. It was all-consuming. And We had three channels then. In 1998? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that big, I guess. Nah, I, had, I, had cable for, I had cable then. I'm saying – but like I was so into it as a kid that like I my family went and watched a movie and I listened to the Senate verdict. I, I was too naive to know that it, it was already decided. But I just don't think that people are paying attention to any of this, and they just kind of go, Adam Schiff. I don't know him, but he really looks like a person that I don't trust. And right. you Trump, think that the I, know I don't trust Donald Trump. 
right. And the, and the other side, the Dershowitzes and the and the Star, nobody trusts them. Uh, they're making all kinds of weird comments. I'm but saying your average. It, this person, is. I'm saying your right. average person will never see a minute of video footage of Alan Dershowitz. Like they won't the, even. It won't even pay attention to get to that point. Right. But what I'm what I'm trying to say is that this isn't really overriding the will of the people when you've got the house and senate both having to decide aren't they representatives of the people that's why we have laws that we come through there right so mm -hmm. the idea is that after the election at some point after the election we find out that the person that we put in office is misusing his office he's selling the office for personal gain uh, right. we should decide whether or not he be removed for that and that's the process that we're going through. And if you can get two thirds of the Senate, you know, and the majority of the house and two thirds of the Senate to agree uh, on anything like that, then I think that's a, that's a, a clear indication that the people are saying, Hey, we want this to happen or they I wouldn't because no, nobody's going to go in there and say, Oh yeah, I'm going to vote against, you know, vote for Trump to be removed as a Republican unless I'm getting hounded by my constituents to do that. Yeah. So uh, it just goes back to it where you you have a lower bar of impeachment than I do, and I just never I, felt like like this is like it's not that it's not egregious, but it's like you know it's oh well. but it's clear. I mean, it's clear cut that this <laughs> right. happened. Everybody believes that it happened. Everybody knows that it happened. So do you just let it go? You say, okay, that's whoop. Any president from now on can do that. It's like they're complaining about the subpoenas, uh, that there was no House vote on the authorizing subpoena power for the, for the committees. They actually said that in the trial today, the, the Republican uh, manager said this, right, defending Trump. And it's like the reason why they didn't have to have that vote in order for the committees to have subpoena was because while you were trying to go get Clinton, you changed the law, the, the Senate, the House rules to say um, all committees have subpoena power in perpetuity from now on. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats told him, you don't want to do that because as soon as you do that, the next person who gets in, when you're not in power in the Democrats and we're in power, don't think it's not going to be used against you. Right. So I think this was a clear message to, when, when they did this without a vote, they could have had the vote and, and gotten it passed without a question. Mm -hmm. They did it without the vote because they wanted to rub it in their faces. Right. Ugh. All right. Well, that, that is the shot. That is the sound that declares the end of impeachment. Uh, so we, we, I don't even know if we need to cover it, but I'm sure we'll cover it next week. We'll talk about, the, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up and we'll, but we'll get into the pedophogging then. Uh, yes, I just can't, you know, if I don't give him a chance to talk about this, he loses his mind. He just can't take it. Uh, I so. wrote notes. I had studied all. I got all this written <laughs> down. <laughs> I'm ready to go for another hour of talking about this. I know. You but are. we're not going to. I understand. We're going to go talk about something else. I also find very important and even wrote an article about back in 2014 or 2012, 2014. I don't know, 2012 maybe. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about this too. Uh, yes. Big so, button issue. The war powers resolution, the authorized use of military force, the the cane bill that's moving forward. Um, a lot of discussion is happening in Washington D.C. That's kind of below the radar, thanks to impeachment and Meghan Markle and uh, even Iran, but. Something surprising, and this is when it got put on my radar, was that after the show, I was just kind of chilling, going through Facebook, and I saw that my senator, Todd Young, who infamously here in Indiana ran a campaign where he literally said, you know, as a Marine, you know, as I'm a Marine, and so therefore I like ice cream, and like he mentioned the fact that he was a Marine every two minutes. He's just a total, you know, Died in the wool Republican, typical Republican type of guy. Uh, and he came out with Mike Lee and Rand Paul and said that he was going to vote for the Kane bill after some amended language that was anti Trump. And I was really surprised by that because if I'm gonna if I'm gonna peg like Todd Young on a national political figure that most of you might know he's certainly not Lindsey Graham and that he's bloodlusty 
but he's just kind of your typical Republican. Like he's like a Ben Shapiro type, you know, he'll say the right things. He's certainly not even remotely libertarian. He's just your standard issue conservative Republican. And I thought it was so gutsy. I couldn't believe that Todd Young was saying that he was going to vote for this. And, and Tim Kaine said that I might have I might have 10 people voting to curb the president's power in starting a war. Now, I felt this was a watershed moment, Reinhold, that I wanted us to talk about because since 9-11, I was, I was kind of thinking about this. I don't know that other than Libya, when it was floated that Obama might invade Libya or send, uh, you know, basically do some police action in Libya and then back down after there was a, a big public outcry, you know, he still went into places like Syria, for instance, it's and Yemen, um, but he avoided Libya. That's the only time in my entire adult life that I could recall politicians who weren't on the fringes, like Ron Paul or Tulsi Gabbard, who are kind of like, you know, we love them because they're independent minded, but they're certainly not mainstream. Uh, that was the only time that I could remember anything like this happening. So it seems pretty significant to me that they would even open a discussion about limiting the ability of the president to begin military action. I mean, is there anything in your memory over the last like 20 years where something comes close to the discussion that's going on in Washington about the war powers and the AUMF? Um, I mean, I've heard discussions, but not to the level that it is now. Uh, not so, I mean, when when Obama did, you know, Obama ran on saying that he didn't have the power to unilaterally use military force without congressional approval. So that's why, you know, all the anti-war people and especially his party at the time uh, all wanted him to run because he was the anti-war guy against, you know, what Trump, had, what a Bush had done. Freudian slip there. Um, then he kind of flipped once he got into office, obviously, and, and changed his mind. And now he decides he doesn't need that. You know, he's been, he's been advised that he doesn't need to uh, seek congressional approval for this stuff. So there was an outcry at the time, but nothing really to the level of we need. And I think, I think it's part of that part where you start seeing that the other person in power, what they could do with this power that you've given to your predecessor or the people you supported. Um, and it's starting to scare you. And I think that's what's going on here is a lot of people are starting to get worried that yeah. we've got a, we've got somebody who's, who's willing to do actions that have absolutely nothing to do with the War Powers Act or the AUMF or any, anything that he's been approved of. He doesn't need, he doesn't need congressional approval to do this. In fact, that's part of the impulpation thing too. He doesn't think the Congress can tell him he can or can't do anything. Sure. So that's the concern. Yeah, and the um, man, I lost it. You you triggered my mind on something. Um, what'd you say? Repeat all that. I hate that. Uh, so no. back in no. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe I'll remember it, but uh, it was very wise and profound, and the and the secret to life. But it's gone now. Um, so I want to thank Sam Schultz for these amazing notes. You can always see our show notes at the in the it's linked always in the show notes on your podcast app or at we are libertarians.com um but let i what i wanted to do is kind of explain the history of this and kind of where it got started and and what you have to understand is that the president and congress began jockeying from the very beginning of this country over the war powers act you know if you've watched the great john adams series then you've seen jefferson and hamilton fighting over you know what was it barbary pirates or some nonsense so you know the constitution gives our in article one gives congress the exclusive authority to declare war most of us know that and article two names the president as commander-in-chief of the armed forces uh now some of the major watershed moments in our history in terms of the centralization of the ability of the military to be deployed without congressional approval under the president really started in 1973. So it's not a very new um, invention. And so the War Powers Resolution was enacted in 1973 in November over an executive veto by President Richard Nixon. And so the law 
it frames it as a meaning of a guaranteeing that, quote, the collective judgment of both the Congress and the president will apply whenever the American armed forces are deployed overseas. It requires the president consult to consult with the legislature and, quote, every possible instance, end quote, before committing troops to war. Now, you know, as we mentioned, the, the Constitution and, and its separation of powers, this was more of a consolidation. And over time, questions have arisen as to the extent of the president's authority to deploy U.S. armed forces into hostile situations abroad without the declaration of war or some other form of congressional approval. Congress passed the War Powers Resolution in the aftermath of the Vietnam War to address these concerns and provide a set of procedures for both the president and Congress to follow in situations where the introduction of U.S. forces abroad could lead to their involvement in armed conflict. Uh, Reinhold, did we? I don't think we had a declaration of war on Korea or Vietnam, did we? I think the last one is Germany and Japan, right? Well, I'm sorry to say this, but I think Reinhold has. Oh, okay, you're away. All right, I didn't know if you passed away I, or what. It, no, it, no, it, I, I just have, I was okay. trying to uh, be be quiet, and I hit the button. I forgot oh. to turn it back on. So, no, it, I think Germany was. You know, World War Two was the last time, or Japan technically was the last war that was you know passed by Congress. Um, I'm trying to remember if there was a approved congressional police action for Korea. Uh, but I know that it was Vietnam that really got everybody concerned and why the War Powers Act was was passed to begin with. So I think that there was some some congressional stuff involved in Korea in order for them to kind of say an okay thing there. And and they were kind of like, okay, do do Vietnam, we understand. I don't know if there was ever anything formally authorized. I imagine there has to be some sort of funding bill like the AUMF, which we'll get right. to. I mean, there had to... I mean, they were so much more cognizant of how the Constitution operated and the separation of powers than we are today. Well, um, even but at the time, the president was saying that he didn't need any approval from Congress to go do whatever he wanted to do with the military, mm -hmm. that the War Powers Act was uh, a limit on his power to do whatever he wanted to do with the military. So um, I don't think it was as clear cut back then either. Okay. So conceptually, the War Powers Resolution can be broken into several distinct parts. The first part states the policy behind the law, namely to ensure that the collective judgment of both Congress and the president will apply to the introduction of the US, U.S. armed forces and to hostilities, and that the president's powers as commander in chief are exercised only pursuant to a declaration of war, specific statutory authorization from Congress, or a national emergency created by an attack on the U.S. Uh, the second part requires the president to consult with Congress before introducing U.S. armed forces into hostilities or situations where hostilities are imminent and to continue such consultations as, the law, as long as the U.S. armed forces remain in such situations. The third part sets forth reporting and requirements that the president must comply with any time he introduces U.S. armed forces into existing or imminent hostilities. Section 1543A1 is particularly significant because it can trigger a 60-day time limit on those U.S. forces. Um, the fourth part of the law concerns congressional actions and procedures of particular interest in Section 1544B, which requires that the U.S. forces be withdrawn from hostilities within 60 days of the time a report is submitted or is required to be submitted unless Congress acts to approve continued military action or is physically unable to meet as a result of an armed attack upon the U.S., Section 1544C requires the president to remove U.S. armed forces that are engaged in hostilities without a declaration of war or specific statutory authorization at any time if Congress so directs by a concurrent resolution. Concurrent resolutions are not laws and are not presented to the president for signature or veto. The procedure contemplated under Section 1544 is known as a legislative veto and is constitutionally questionable in light of the decision of the Supreme Court in INS versus Chada. Chada. In the fifth part, it sets forth certain definitions and rules to be used when interpreting the War Powers Resolution. In the sixth part is a separability provision and states that if any part of the law is held by court to be invalid on its face or is applied to a particular situation, the rest of the law shall not be considered invalid nor shall its applicability to other situations be affected. 
U.S. presidents have consistently taken the position that the War Powers Resolution is an unconstitutional infringement upon the power of the executive branch. As a result, the resolution has been the subject of controversy since its enactment and a recurring issue due to the ongoing worldwide deployment of U.S. forces. And I think it's that's a reiteration of what you said. And I, I, I sort of acted like the War Powers Act was uh, pro uh combining that's my apologies i misrepresented it you're exactly right it was a check on things like the pentagon papers came out and everybody went what are we doing we need to reel this in a little bit and that's what the war powers resolution was about right and that was yeah, they were really upset about what was going on in vietnam and the protests that was going on the, the popularity for that that a war was waning. Uh, it was still enough to get him reelected, but it was waning at the time. And um, then after it kind of all fell apart, that's when they said in 74, let's, we're done with this, right? So we, um, they introduced the War Powers Act to say no more of this for the president. And um, I think it was not too long before he was impeached. So I think we're, the Watergate was going on at the time. So um, that's, kind of where that comes from but um at the time though he his veto that he vetoed for this because he felt that it was a a limit on his power uh, his veto was overridden which right. i don't think we're going to see happen this time yeah nixon called it unconstitutional and dangerous as a check on his duties as commander-in-chief in a message accompanying his veto, Nixon argued that the resolution would, quote, attempt to take away by mere legislative act authorities, which the president has properly exercised under the Constitution for almost 200 years. The problem with saying that is that if you know anything about Vietnam, they didn't properly exercise constitutional authority. They hid and lied to the American people, to Congress, as Democrat and Republican administrations led us deeper and deeper into wars and escalated us even further into a, a, an unwinnable war like Vietnam that really is right. responsible for a lot of the tearing of our social fabric now. And it wasn't even just Vietnam. It was also Laos and Cambodia that they were lying about. They, we weren't there. We weren't in Laos. We weren't in Cambodia, but we were. Yeah. Now, since the 70s, every president has either sidestepped or labeled it unconstitutional. And one of the first major challenges to the war resolution came in 81 when Reagan deployed military personnel to El Salvador without consulting or submitting a report to Congress. In 99, Bill Clinton continued a bombing campaign in Kosovo beyond the 60-day time limit cited in the law. And in uh, 2001 or 2011, Obama initiated military action in Libya without congressional authorization. And that was when Congress really started to fight back. Uh, many of the congressmen <laughs> who were mad at Obama for Libya are pro Iran and Trump. And then many of the Republican congressmen who were say <laughs> when Clinton was in office, it's just amazing how they flip flop. Um, so that's the war powers resolution. It was a way to curb it. Um, now let's talk about what an AUMF is. You will often hear this authorized use. It's the authorization for the use of military force on September 18th, 2001, President George W. Bush signed the AUMF into law in response to the 9-11 attacks. It authorized the president to, quote, use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or person in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Rather than authorizing a broad and unlimited, quote, war on terror, the AUMF's mandates specifically tied those it, to those responsible for 9-11. Now, the AUMF has continued to be used as a legal basis for U.S. military action in the Middle East. In 2002, a separate AUMF grants the president the authority to defend the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq, and has been used to provide a basis for ongoing anti-ISIS operations, specifically in Iraq. So any thoughts about the origin of the AUMF? Like, were you in favor of this? I know you were probably pretty in tune with, with these debates, but, you know, I was a, a good little neocon, so I was all for it, because uh, I didn't know any better. 
But I mean, mm. what were your kind of thoughts when this was going on? Uh, my thoughts when it was going on was that it was a little different for me back then. I was actually supporting the initial Iraq invasion um, and the use of a, a military force for a variety of reasons that all fell apart for the most part. In 2002 or 91? Uh, 2002. The, the 91 thing, um, I will admit I was much more of a uh, conservative I was a it was a weird mix of conservative and liberal the at the same time. Uh, I was out of the military in eighty seven, so ninety one. I was actually in college or in in a, a a trade school college type thing, and people were all worried about it. I'm like, we're going to go over there and we're going to bomb the heck out of them, and it's not going to be like a big war. I mean, we're not going to. It's not going to hurt us in any way. People were afraid that we were going to get attacked because it was the fourth largest army on the globe. We were fighting. Remember. That's what Iraq was. And um, I, but I was kind of still behind Bush senior on it because um, I mean, they had invaded another country. Right. I mean, kind of like what Russia did with uh, recently, but they had invaded this other country, even though we find out now that, you know, we kind of told them they could a little bit. Um, and then he got upset about it and um, decided that he needed to go and remove them and, uh, and free Kuwait from, from that oppression because they, they were really worried about another Hitler mm -hmm. coming along. Right. You know, little by little by little, we had appeasement. We let them take land and we let them take this country and as part of this country. And um, they, that's kind of what the thinking was at the time in 91. So between 91 and 2002, we of course had horrible sanctions on, on Iraq. We bombed them several times. We had inspectors in there because they were, trying to fool everybody into thinking they still had WMDs. So we were believing them and um, just, there was just so much propaganda about it that the truth was hard to really ferret out. And I think it's a little bit easier to ferret out truth these days, uh, but it wasn't as easy back then. It's, it's really to hard get. to hide stuff now. People are so, yeah. much, they're may, way more conspiratorial now, but it's way easier to see the truth if you just pay attention and read the right stuff. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll get all kinds of accusations of some just crazy stuff off the wall that you have to kind of watch out for. But you do kind of, you can start to sift through and say, okay, does this line up with the facts? And this, does this verify it anywhere else? And you can start to see kind of what's going on behind the scenes and um, a lot more than you could back then because there were gatekeepers back in 91 to the news that you were getting. You, were, you weren't, there was no journalism, student journalism, individual journalism, that sort of thing going on. It was, uh, it was very much gatekeeped. So um, when 2002 rolled around, we just had the 9-11. That was a very, I think it changed a lot of people's psyche for a little while. Even people who were mostly anti-war were still kind of like, well, that's a bit too far. and We need to, you know, push back here. But um, I think we picked the wrong targets. I think we did it you know, all wrong, but I did kind of support a little bit of what was going on there. So that was my thing was that at least Bush respected the constitution enough to go get the authorization to go into Iraq. And he didn't just go in like uh, other presidents had done before and since. Right. So the AUMF is still being used, even though it feels like, Oh, we don't, we don't have a, an active war like we did. And that was 20 years ago. And you know, we're not really in Afghanistan. Well, it's still being used. And successive argue, uh, administrations have argued that the AUMF obtained in 01 applies to fight the fight against ISIS and that approval from Congress to conduct operations against ISIS, wherever they may be, is unnecessary. A written statement to the Times, Obama's White House's legal team defended the campaign against ISIS in, in 14 writing the president may rely on the 2001 AUMF as a statutory authority for the military airstrike operations he is directing against ISIL. The Obama White House further explained that it interpreted the 2001 AUMF to cover the use of force against ISIS based on the group's longstanding relationship with al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, its long history of conducting and continued desire to conduct against attacks against the U.S., and its extensive history of U.S. combat operations against ISIL uh, going back to 2004. Um, yeah, I think why it's surprising, uh, and Trump, too, has 
used it. He has a broad interpretation in two letters published by the New York Times in 2018. Officials from the Pentagon and State Department wrote, the 2001 AUMF authorizes the United States to use force against al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces against ISIS. They then appeared to interpret the purview of the 2001 AUMF even more broadly to encompass the limited airstrikes against the Syrian regime and pro-regime forces to defend the, U defend the U.S. Constitution uh, the U.S. coalition and partner forces, excuse me, engaged in the campaign to defeat ISIS while also noting that Syrian regime forces are not associated forces of ISIS under a AUMF. I may need bigger, I may need glasses. I think I'm starting to get to bifocal territory, Reinhold. But what is interesting about Obama and Trump continuing this policy, and this is the dangerous thing that when you you have to remember when you give a president power like this it doesn't go away under one administration when you say oh yeah we should have this spying thing called prism that allows the government to collect every electronic signal in the in the universe that means that donald trump and barack obama and george bush and whatever crazy person bernie sanders may be next they all get to use the same tools the same laws the same right. uh, permissions. And what's interesting is that Obama and Trump ran on more non-interventionist, uh, maybe not fully non-interventionist like a Ron Paul, but Obama certainly ran like he was some sort of dove, uh, beat Hillary Clinton in the primary because she had voted for the RAC a AUMF. You know, Donald Trump is the most non-interventionist president we've ever had in history, man. Uh, but they have continued to do the exact same things as president that George W. Bush, the evil George W. Bush did. Even more, yeah. They've been amping it up, as it were. Right. Uh, which is, Drone King which is Barack Obama. Right. So there was an article in The Atlantic in 2014, um, where actually it's 2015, I think. Um, nope. It was actually 2016. Sorry. Uh, but they were arguing the same thing you're arguing right now. They were saying, hey, you know, we're in the third year of Syria here. Mm -hmm. um, and it was gone into under very flimsy um, support and most likely unconstitutional. And all we're doing is we're handing the next president, whoever it may be, the power to continue doing this. And that's what the whole article is about was, do we think that this is a good idea? So even people who were pro Obama, pro uh, what he was trying to do there still were itchy and concerned about that power being handed over to um, the president to make those decisions on where we're going to go send our, our military. Yeah. So be careful. Make sure that if you care about this stuff, you interview the people that you're voting for or check how they feel about, you know, are they truly non-interventionists because they may continue those policies? Well, it's and like I said, go ahead. you know, Obama even said that he did not have the power to do exactly what he ended up doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. he won the Nobel Peace Prize and then did everything George Bush did and more. Um, well, I wouldn't say more. That's not fair. <laughs> he didn't invade and kill a million people. Um, so that leads us to Tim Kaine's attempt to limit Trump's ability to take military action against Iran. Tim Kaine was the running mate in 2016 of Hillary Clinton. He's a, Republic, he's a Democrat from Virginia. He's a senator, and he's circulating a bipartisan resolution that would direct the, pres the president to remove U.S. forces from any hostilities against Iran within 30 days of its enactment. As many as 10 Republican senators are considering backing the resolution – GOP Senators Mike Lee and Rand Paul have already voiced their support for the measure, and Kane says about eight or more Republicans, including Susan Collin, Lisa Murkowski, Todd Young, and Mitt Romney are even reviewing it. Senator Todd Young later revealed that he would, in fact, support a revised resolution. In statements to reporters, Young said, I will be supporting, shall we call it Kane 2.0, the new Kane language, should I have the opportunity to vote on it. Collins later said she would support the resolution. Congress cannot be sidelined on these important decisions, she said, uh, although the resolution would uh, continue to allow Trump to repel an imminent attack. Only the legislative branch may declare war or commit our armed forces to a sustained military conflict with Iran. The Republican de 
defectors were discouraged, quote, that the attitude that was being communicated to us was that Congress was an annoyance, Kane said. After that, they came to me, and we've been able to make some amendments, and uh, that is typically how emperors <laughs> behave. They treat the senators like uh, annoyances, and then they knife them on the Ides of March. Um, Kane has been making changes to the resolution as he's tried to gather more Republican support. He removed two paragraphs in the findings section that directly mentioned Trump over concerns from Republicans and some Democrats that it was too political. Kane also said he was working in some of the language from the House passed war res powers resolution into his, specifically changing this wording about removing troops to the lower chamber's use of the, quote, termination of the use of the U.S. armed forces and hostilities against Iran after some colleagues raised concerns that, quote, removing, end quote, suggested a pullback of U.S. troops from the region. The horror. If it passes the Senate, the House would also need to pass the resolution before it can be sent to the White House, where Trump is expected to veto it. Lee, Mike Lee, this uh, Republican senator from Utah, I believe, uh, said fellow Republicans should view the Kane sponsored resolution as a, quote, completely non-controversial measure that restates the Constitution's declaration that Congress shall have the sole power to declare war. Kane's proposed legislation, however, has its limitations. The War Powers Resolution restricts actions only by the United States military, so it would not stop Trump from carrying out targeted attacks on Iranian military leaders or other discrete operations as long as he carried them out covertly under the authority of the CIA. Trump's DOJ would also probably take the position that the resolution infringed on the president's constitutional authority, and so the president might just ignore the resolution. Also, under Article 2 of the Constitution, the president may act to respond to imminent threats to the nation, and the U.N. Charter includes an exception for self-defense. The excuse of imminent danger would also most likely be used by the White House to conduct further attacks, similar to the justification for the strike on Soleimani, which started all of this. That vote, that vote will come this week, but is still unclear when or how, given the impeachment trial. And recent examples have shown GOP lawmakers' willingness to go against Trump when it comes to preserving the congressional powers. Seven Senate Republicans voted in March to direct Trump to withdraw troops from supporting a Saudi-led coalition fighting in Yemen civil war, a resolution that Trump later vetoed and Congress failed to override. Eleven GOP senators voted with Democrats in September to terminate a national emergency declaration Trump used to justify shifting military funds to construction of the border wall without congressional consent. Twelve GOP senators voted for a similar resolution in March. Uh, I think that – so here's the thing. I'm, I'm giving you stuff about impeachment, but in both of these cases, in the War Powers Act and impeachment, it seems like Congress is doing something that we here have been saying for a long time, which is wake up. Quit, quit letting us slide. There's a great book by the Mises Institute called Reassessing the Presidency, an intentionally banal title. And the basis of the book is showing you how every president has sent to se centralize the authority of the president in, in taking us to an imperial mindset towards the presidency and arguing against the growth of the centralization of the state under the presidency and Congre Congress's do, uh, complicity in all of that. Um, so, Reinhold, I guess, you know, if you're going to say to me, I, I guess I have to be consistent that if I like them curbing the president's power under the by curbing his ability to start wars, I guess I shouldn't be too I'm I'm not mad that they're impeaching him. I really don't care. Like it's one of those things where it's like I'm not angry, but I do I guess I do have to be more consistent that if I want his powers to be curbed in one area, then I should probably want his powers curbed in others. And it's not about the man. It's about Congress trying to make sure that it is a co-equal branch of government. Right. And that's, and that's really the, the, the our second article of the impeachment was that he was basically stating that Congress had no say in anything he does. And I think that's a concern that we don't want to allow because it's not just there that it's going to come, right? So it's, it's going to be in the war power stuff and that sort of thing. The way I read, I read the Constitution um, is that 
the power of the purse was given to Congress, right? Um, but the executive spends the money allocated to it. So the, the, the president can't just go start spending money. He has to have authorization to spend the money. And then he's directed, he directs how it goes and with, with certain rules and limits and that sort of thing that Congress places on him. The same goes for declaring war. And for some reason, they want to read that whole completely differently to not be that the Congress is the only one that can authorize the use of military. And then the president just directs how it's, how it's, uh, how it's done, just like with the purse strings. Uh, but the president's trying to say that I can send the military wherever I want to, um, as long as I don't call it a war, mm -hmm. right? As long as we're under an imminent attack. So it's a police action. Right. So that was, that was really, I think, where this whole fight came from. So the War Powers Act was really supposed to uh, reassert that power. And that's why it was vetoed and the veto was overridden because the president was trying to say, no, I have the, I have the power to do this and you can't stop me. And Congress said, oh, yeah, we can. Um, and I don't think it's ever really played out to they really can, they, they really have, right? So part of the problem is, is that uh, there was a decision a few um, – probably about a decade or two ago that Congress can't sue um, to get something labeled as unconstitutional that the president does. That's considered an interbranch thing. So the justice department, the, the courts won't get involved with it because they say that the, the, the Senate or the Congress doesn't have a standing. Um, so you get into this weird thing where how does this, how does the Congress reassert its, constitutional authority if the president just ignores it and the, and the courts don't step in. So we need other people filing lawsuits to find it unconstitutional, that sort of thing. So that's, that's where that kind of game gets played. Uh, but when it was passed, there was something in the, in the war powers act that's very important that a lot of people are uh, kind of missing is that it says that he can put those troops uh, where he wants to for 60 days before reporting back to Congress on it, but only if it's a national emergency on our homeland, right? Or our, pro our territories or properties, right? So that does not include anything going on in any other country, right? So just because the War Powers Act says he could, you know, send troops out for 60 days, it's only in that case. And that case hasn't been met for for decades right there's no there's no no reason to even do that except for 9-11 and 9-11 there was really no one to go attack really because the people who attacked us are all dead so it's it's kind of frustrating on that end because people want to gloss over that and just say oh no the war powers act gives him the up uh, the authority to do whatever he wants for 60 days and that's not the case and the aumf specifically states in there that Nothing that they agree to in that article of that law supersedes the War Powers Act. So even under the AUMF, he can't put people, put forces in place without notifying Congress um, unless it's an imminent attack. So that's, that's why it was so interesting when um, he tried to say it was an imminent attack, why he went after um, the, you know, the Iranian, uh, but uh, Soleimani, but, the, uh, the reality is he came back later and said, no, it wasn't eminent. We had planned it nine months ago, um, and it doesn't matter. He's trying to say it doesn't matter. And I think that's what really frustrated and angered a lot of the Republicans who are now thinking about supporting it is that he just flagrantly, you know, waved, waved it in his face, in their face to say, uh, no, I can do whatever I want. And, uh, they're starting to say, Hey, no, there's gotta be some limits and, and they're feeling kind of frustrated about that. So I think that's where some of that support's finally coming in on. I don't know if they're ever going to get enough to override the veto. It's the same with the, uh, the, now the impeachment you have to have, if Trump has a certain number of senators in his pocket, you know, can anybody really stop him at that point? Right. All right. Well, let's wrap up. So just give a few final thoughts and then we'll, uh, we'll end this puppy and bring it to its merciful end. Um, well, really final thoughts as I kind of agree with what you came to that point 
at the end there where if we're talking about limiting the president's power and he's overstepping his boundaries, there has to be some mechanism to pull him back. And it's not just this president that has to be pulled back. It was the last one and the one before and the next one, the next one after that. At some point, we have to step up and say, we're not going to let this happen anymore. We're not going to let the president just start becoming a king or a monarch. Uh, at some point, we have to say no to that. And just because it's your guy that is doing it or it's the other guy that's doing it, that shouldn't weigh into it. It should be the office of the president against the office of the Congress, right? Uh, those two branches of government working out who's going to be doing what and who has what powers. And the Constitution is very clear on all of this stuff. So um, I really think those are kind of two, two sides of the same coin. We're still, we're, we need to limit that centralization of power um, by the central authority that we've elected. Couldn't agree more. Uh, let's end there. Thank you so much for being here, Reinhold. Uh, thanks for having me. And I hope to see you again soon. It's always great to have a co-host who's chatty when you're very tired. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we talked earlier about, yeah. can you go for, can you go for a little while on impeachment? And I'm like, yeah, I think I can make it happen. I know. I, te I texted him. I go, listen, uh, haven't had a chance to read any of this impeachment stuff, but we got to cover it. Are you prepared to talk to about it for 30 minutes? And he's like, am I? So, uh, so great, great stuff. And, uh, and uh, thanks so much to our researcher, Sam Schultz. If you'd like to join our research team, hit me up at editor at We Are Libertarians. He does a great job, but uh, you know, we're always looking to cover more and, and you know, he, we make him work every week. So I'd like to, give him a break when, when he needs it. So hit us up, editor at We Are Libertarians, if you want to participate in creating some of the show notes. So there's always, there's lots to do here. Uh, but I just want to say thank you for listening to We Are Libertarians. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for supporting the libertarian cause. And if you're just curious, please stick around. We'll be back next week. We'll probably be talking impeachment um, and, and just kind of end that saga, hopefully. Uh, so we'll talk about that next week, and we hope that you will join us, and we will see you then. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you next week.